Can't decide in torn between a romantic, comedy, action, or an indie film to watch for the weekend? Well, well, well. Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast is your ultimate guide to the latest movies. Join us as we dissect the latest on the blockbusters. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast. the GSMC Movie Podcast, brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Stacey, and with me is a very special guest, new GSMC Podcast host, Heidi. Hello! And if you listened to the last episode, you know it was me, Heidi, and Sarah, but we decided to kick Sarah out for this one. <laughs> we just want to do it by ourselves. We don't want Sarah to hold us down. We're kidding. We love Sarah. <laughs> but it's just going to be me and Heidi today, and today we are talking about two films about mothers who are very, very protective and or vengeful about their daughters. You do not want to mess with these moms. They will hurt you. So the first film is Peppermint, and this is the new film starring Jennifer Garner. Heidi, have you seen this one? I have not, but I love the name. Peppermint? Well, and the peppermint comes from that her daughter wanted a peppermint ice cream. I guess that was her favorite flavor. I didn't even know they made peppermint yeah, ice cream. Not like, during Christmas. Well, I guess. And it is actually during Christmas time. Oh, okay. But I was just like, I, what is that? I Chocolate, vanilla, Rocky Road, even though I think that's strange. You start getting into like cotton candy, which I also <laughs> think is strange. Birthday cake, fine. But peppermint feels so like both classical and yet new that I'm like, I, what? Do you like peppermint candies? I like thin mints. <laughs> and that's... I actually don't. I prefer spearmint mints, but I like thin mint cookies. Okay. The ice cream probably doesn't have chocolate in it. You might not be interested. Yeah. So uh, in this, uh, Jennifer Garner plays Riley and her daughter Carly and her husband are gunned down because her husband, he worked at an auto shop and he didn't make a lot of money. And she worked at a bank and didn't make a lot of money. And her husband had been offered a job to just be the driver for what sounds like a robbery. But this robbery was going to be robbing a cartel. And the cartel somehow found out about this. And even though the job had not taken place, and we later see that the husband decided, you know what? No, I'm not even going to do this job. I'm not going to risk my family. The cartel decides to send a message. And so they gun them down. Oh, wow. In public at a Christmas carnival. No. (laughs) No. Jennifer oh. Garner survives. Both her husband and daughter are killed. She can identify the three guys who were involved in the shooting, mm-hmm. but there isn't really any physical evidence to tie them in. And the cartel is a very scary thing, so no one will come forward. So they get off, and it seems like from that, both lawyers and the judge are kind of in on it also. What? So she feels very upset. She disappears for five years, and this is in the trailer, they say so. And then comes back to take revenge on the people who killed her family. She's been spending the five years training. But we will talk more about that training after this short break, so stay tuned. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers, be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between 4 and 6,000 pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. Welcome back to the GSMC Movie Podcast, where we are talking about Peppermint and Jennifer Garner and the intense training that she would have, of course, have to have gone through to revenge her family. 
we don't unfortunately get to see that training. Which I'm like, <laughs> that would actually be really interesting. I want it because when we start, she's pretty nice. She's uh, mm-hmm. a bank teller or mm-hmm. something. It's not clear what she does at the bank, but she does work at a bank. Her daughter is in not the Girl Scouts, but the something Scouts. And they have a sort of tiff with another mother and daughter <laughs> because they like stepped on their cookie selling turf. And oh I'm just my like, gosh. is this really that serious? But then because of that, her daughter was supposed to have a birthday party the night she was killed, but none of the friends showed up because they all went oh, to the no. other girl's house because she was rich. <sighs> so it's just like, there's a lot going on where you can just really feel for Jennifer Garner because mm-hmm. it's like everything went wrong that night. <laughs> all you poor you. <laughs> but then even though the whole setup is, okay, her family was killed and she didn't get justice. So she's going to go train to, you know, get back at the mm-hmm. killers. Mm-hmm. We don't spend a lot of time on that. So do you go in knowing what her training is? No, I have no, you, you get a thing when the FBI is brought in that, you know, she showed up in a video doing MMA fighting mm. and then she showed up on the internet a few months later, like robbing a gun store oh, wow. and knew only to take the specific certain guns. And you heard about her in some country, but you never really see any training. I have no clue who she trained <laughs> with. I don't know if she trained herself. And if so, how did you know to train yourself to be the super right, killing right. machine? It's just like, I, uh, okay, fine. We, the, we don't care about that. I care about that, actually, filmmaker. It's like, why don't we get to right. see that? Where does this take place? Is this it like is current in, day? Yeah, it's current day. And it's in LA because okay. when she comes back, she's actually staying in Skid Row. Oh. And that's part of the thing. This this is also in the trailer, and that's where the uh, poster comes from with her with the, like the graffitied red wing- wings behind her. Oh, and yeah. She's staying in Skid Row, but she's become sort of the guardian angel there. So people aren't dangerous there anymore. They all left, and so the people who stay there, the homeless people or whatever, mm-hmm. see her as like their angel. And so while she's trying to, you know, take revenge, mm-hmm. she's also protecting other people. Kind of, you, you get like a vigilante it. Yeah. type. Okay. So you get hints of it, but you don't see it too much. And you don't even see too much of the killing of the revenge people. Because within like really? the first 20 minutes, you see that shot from the trailer where there's the three guys hanging from the Ferris wheel. You only see her even kind of fight one. I have no idea what happened with the other two and how she got to them. I have no idea you know, what happened with the lawyers. We don't see that. We do hear that she did somehow get to them. Oh, wow. We do see her take on the judge and how she got him. But it's just like... So that whole revenge plot was right. like a, a MacGuffin almost. Like we don't spend too much time on it. Yeah, and that's a lot of revenge. <laughs> right. What we do get is because she's now taken out these people and it comes out that she's maybe taken out some mm. shipments that the cartel mm-hmm. was doing, the cartel boss is upset about this and wants to take her out. So it's a lot of fight scenes of him sending people to try and kill her and her, of course, you know, not being killed. Wow. So it's, it's like, like Kill Bill kind of? Kind of, except they weren't originally, like, they didn't all know her. Mm. The the cartel doesn't even know that she's doing the shipments until she kills these guys. Oh, wow. They only put it together later. And she actually does go to one of the cartel's warehouses, I think, before they're even aware of her. Because I guess her mission is like, okay, first and foremost, the people who actually were responsible for A, killing my family, or B, Mm -hmm. letting those people get off. But then because I'm now onto this, let's clean up all terribleness, Mm. vigilante thing, I'm just going to take out this cartel, period, it seems. I can't even remember now who struck first. Is it her (laughs) with the cartel that's not involved with her family or the cartel at her? But you do get you get a number of action scenes. There's one at a pinata factory. There's one at a very nice house. It's just... Wow, I'm getting like a Batman kind of vibe. Except not as much, <laughs> like, not as much fighting. Well, like I wanted to like her, and I, mm-hmm. I kind of quite like Jennifer Garner. Mm-hmm. I think part of the problem is uh, Heidi. You weren't here for this, but in a very early episode for me, I talked about Breaking In, which was the movie where Gabrielle Union was a mom and her kids were stuck in their house with these robbers. Mm. That actually did the whole like "don't mess with my kids" thing better. Um, for this, part of it maybe is because her daughter's dead. Right, And yeah. so there's not the immediateness of, like, I have to. Right, there's not the protection yeah. involved. I don't have, like, I have to survive right now, or else it's sort of like, I want to survive and kill all these people, but if I don't, <laughs> whatever, it's just like, yeah. Yeah, nothing to lose. Yeah. And also the action just was sort of, A, th- this film is not at all shy about violence. <laughs> like, you see... A number of shots to the head mm. and I was both like 
On the one hand, I don't think that's enough blood if you actually had a shot to the head. But on the <laughs> other hand, why do you have to show me every shot to the head? It's wow. like you do not miss any. And you get a lot, also a lot of like breaking of bones and legs. Ooh. And the sound effects oh. for that are there. <laughs> like I, there was actually one where I could kind of tell that she was going to break this person's arm or leg. And I tried to like plug my ears. But I watched <laughs> this in the theater and I was just like, and I just, I, I'm not squeamish, but I don't need to hear that. Right, right. It's like, you can, you can be subtle about that and just sort of hint at it without showing it to me, and I'm fine. Like, I don't need to see every violent thing possible. And then it's just sort of, there's, a, there's clearly something, there's a lot about corruption in the cops. Mm. The mm. film is dealing, there's supposedly a corrupt cop in the police station, though we don't quite know who it is. I had a hard time with, there are both the local police and the FBI involved, but the local police are somehow in charge of this, oh. even when the FBI comes in. And so I'm are they like, all like going after her? They are, but they come to her for different reasons. The police, because this was their case mm -hmm. when her family was killed. Mm -hmm. The FBI, because I think of the gun shop robbery, she showed up on their radar and then oh. showed up for something else. And I can kind of keep them straight in my head, mostly because, thankfully, they don't look alike. Right, different there's uniforms. A, well, there's an older uh, there's an older police guy and a younger police guy. Mm. And then the FBI people are a male and a female, but you don't even see the male that much. So it's like, you don't look anything alike, mm. so I know mm -hmm. who you are. But at the same time, I'm a little confused of where you are in the situation and what you know and what you don't. Because I, as the audience member obviously know a bit more because we're seeing everything with Riley as she does it. Mm -hmm. But the police obviously don't know all these things. So I'm like, wait, don't you already know she's, oh, you don't know that she's, <laughs> oh, wait, what do you know again? I, can I get you to just like do a quick debriefing of what the authorities in this film know or not? Because I'm confused right. what you know or not. And so I'm expecting you to like already be somewhere and you're not. So, and then the action scenes were just, they were okay and loud and soundful, <laughs> but I wasn't super like, there was a couple of things where I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure she should uh, not be able to move that well. She's not, she, she thankfully doesn't come off as like, oh, nobody can touch me. I'm invincible. Oh, that's good. She does get cut and stabbed mm -hmm. and. She gets wounded. Yeah, yeah, she gets wounded and then you'll see her limping. So it's mm -hmm. not like nothing touches her. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like. This is one woman, and fine, she's got military-grade weapons, but she's taking on a cartel, like, <laughs> oh, including when we get to the scene with the house. This is, like, the boss's house, so oh. we've got a bunch of guards around, and you, the guards are all just sort of, like, nameless guard number one or whatever. Like, you don't really get to know them. I think there's only, like, four that even have lines, and none of those are the ones that were actually involved with her family, mm. but I don't remember any of their names by the end of the film, and I'm just like... Am I supposed to, I, like, she already got revenge, so I'm right. not sure I care anymore. It's like, why do we need, I find, I mean, I don't want the cartel to stick around, but I'm not into this as much as if you had actually shown me the whole process of her getting revenge, which I would have right, cared about. Right. And then you get these two children in Skid Row that are supposed to sort of tie us in to the sympathy thing because, oh. you know, she still sees them. She's still a mom, even if mm -hmm. her daughter's dead. Mm -hmm. And there is a scene where the children are sort of in danger. And I'm like, that just feels manipulative, you know? Mm. So what about you, Heidi? Are you a big fan of, like, revenge films? I like some revenge films. I enjoy action. Yeah. But I feel like from your description, I probably would have enjoyed seeing some of her training Right. And how she came to where she is and to have all of her skills. I feel like that sounds very interesting, um, especially if there's like really bloody sound effect <laughs> type yes. takedowns, which I probably wouldn't have enjoyed, especially in a theater. Yes. Um, I'm a little squeamish. Um, but I, I generally enjoy a good revenge film. I'm, do you root for, do you feel like you were rooting for her or did she sort of become like a villain in all of her revenge? She never felt like a villain, but she doesn't even feel like an anti-hero, which is mm. where some revenge films will take mm -hmm. you where it's like, you were a good guy, but you had this yeah. bad thing happen to yeah. you. So now it's like, I did feel kind of bad for some of the cartel guys because it's just like, <laughs> you were just supposed to stand outside this factory <laughs> and you got shot because, hey, you're in the way. And if you, right, she right. came up to you, you try and kill her. But 
you didn't need to be shot, I don't think, <laughs> technically. So I'm like, I kind of feel bad for nameless bad guy number seven. Right, just another stormtrooper. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. And that is sort of, there is especially a scene in the Pinata Factory where it kind of feels like that. Mm. <laughs> she comes upon these people in a room and they notice her and then they start shooting at her. But she doesn't, she stands still, but they still somehow don't Oh, that is her. definitely like a stormtrooper syndrome <laughs> where they can like, never hit her. <laughs> never hit her. And there's some times where I'm like, I feel you should physically not still be capable of moving. She right, at one point right. like falls a story or two oh, and hits a couple of things before she finally hits the ground. And I'm like, mm. does she wear like armor or anything? She does at one point have on, I think, a bulletproof vest. Okay. At least about it. some sense. <laughs> yeah. And then when we get to, fi- by the time we get to the final showdown where everyone comes together, all the parties are involved and it's like, who's going to live and who's going to mm. die at this night? I'm just sort of like, I don't care. If she dies, then I'll be amazed, but I totally expect that she won't <laughs> die, so can we move on? Like, by the end of it, I was just like, eh, it's not. Yeah. You didn't show me the part that would actually have emotionally invested me, which mm. was the, is she going to get revenge mm-hmm. for her murdered family? Mm-hmm. And the action's just not enough for me to be like, oh, that was really amazing. So I was just like, eh, whatever, not the best, like, you know, revenge film I've ever seen. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. The average sedan is built with a steel frame and equipped with six airbags. Remember this the next time you see someone walking. Drivers, be aware. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. The average SUV has two blind spots, weighs between four and 6,000 pounds, and takes about six seconds to stop. Remember this the next time you're on foot. Pay attention, people. Pedestrians don't have armor. A message from the California Office of Traffic Safety. Welcome back to the GSMC Movie Podcast. Our second film on this Don't Mess With My Daughter episode is Flight Plan. And this stars Jodie Foster as a woman whose husband has recently died under mysterious circumstances. So she and her daughter are flying his body back to the U.S. But on their flight, her daughter goes missing and nobody else seems to have ever seen her. And so they're not too, they're not too up on helping her trying to find it. And this then leads to, oh, there's actually something else going on in this movie. So I remember seeing the previews for this like years and years ago, because this film is, I believe, 2002 or so. It's like right after 9-11. And you do actually get that in the film. There is a couple of characters who are Arabs. And there is a character on the plane who is almost sort of the stereotypical America American, who, of course, immediately assumes, oh, they're Arabs, so they must be terrorists, and there's friction between them. And I was like, okay, I got it. I get that this is, you know, right at this time. But then that kind of takes it out for me with this whole story of people think she's crazy because no one saw her daughter on this flight. It's just sort of like, wait, what? I like the way the film is done. And I want to, like, I'm trying to think now... I feel like I like Jodie Foster, but I can't actually think of too many things I've seen her in. Have you seen her in anything, Heidi? I've seen her in... She's in Taxi Driver, right? Right. Yep. That's, yeah, she's really good in that. It's my most iconic yeah. memory of her in a role. Actually, in this movie, how is her daughter really young? Her daughter is... She's supposed to be six. Okay. That makes more sense for yeah. her to go missing. And she gets missing on the plane? Yes. So when they land, she's not there? Well, and... this whole thing takes place while they're up in the air. Oh. So they get on the plane. The plane is flying from, I believe, Germany to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, but she and her daughter go to take a nap in the back rows because we, it's mentioned several times that there's like 425 passengers on this plane. And this is a plane that has, you know, an upper story and a lower story. Oh, okay, wow. But then it still also has a lot of empty seats in it. So it's not full <laughs> to capacity. And it seems they're possibly flying at night, maybe. You just get the sense that it's nighttime a lot. Mm-hmm. So she and her daughter are allowed on the plane first because 
uh, parents with young children are allowed to board before right, everyone early else. Boarding. Mm-hmm. And she and her daughter board, but her daughter is shy. And so she kind of hides under her mother's coat when they go places. Oh, so that's why people like don't really remember her. Yeah. Sort so, of. Well, and they're literally the first people on the plane. So we don't even see them do like their ticket at the boarding gate. We simply oh. see her carrying her daughter, walking down the, uh, the thing I've just forgotten that connects to the plane. And then you see them get into her seats. But then when other people start arriving, her daughter is crouched down behind the seat in the mm. window seat because she has found like a toy plane or something. And so she crouched down to pick it up. And so people don't even see her daughter when they come to their own seats. Oh. And so later they go to take a nap and she wakes up and her daughter's not there. And she at first thinks her daughter's just gone off to explore. But then when it, you know, it turns out she can't find her daughter at all. She starts freaking out. But people are like, no one saw your daughter. And then it later comes out. We have no record of your daughter ever being what? on this flight. Do you think people are like thinking that because, oh, you just lost your husband. Like you're sort of well, not in the yes. right state of mind. That does come up. And um, she eventually does get to talk to the captain who asks her if she's on any sort of medication or whatever. And she is actually on, I think it's clonopin or something. Mm. And so there is the, you know, everyone thinks, oh, maybe she's crazy. And this is from grief. And then you start getting certain things happening where even as the audience, it feels like, I don't know if she did. I imagine did she imagine she oh. has a daughter? Am I imagining she has a daughter? Like you see everything pretty much from her perspective, mm-hmm. but because you don't really see the daughter interact with anyone else, it is very questionable. Of like, is this one of those things where she's just imagining this person and this person's not really real? But as the film goes on, Jodie Foster becomes more and more frantic because obviously she can't find her daughter. Right, right. This is a six-year-old, and nobody will believe me. And Jodie Foster's character, she supposedly works for the company that built the airplane. So she knows it really well. And so she's adamant that, you know, there are a bunch of places that a little girl could hide on this plane. But the pilot and the crew were all like, yeah, but how could she get into those? Because you're not supposed to be able to get into those unless you're a crew member. Hmm. And so she's like, look, I know I have a daughter and I'm frantic about it. So she could be in any one of these, you know, 100 places. And they're like, she couldn't be and she's not real. And so there's a lot of you know, at cross purposes. Between and that's them. all while they're in the air and everything. The whole, up until the sort of near the end, they're all in the air. You get a beginning where you see, oh, her husband's dead. But that beginning is actually uh, crossed with scenes of her walking with her husband. So later mm. when you get to the thing of like, oh, we think you're imagining her. It's like, well, are you? Because you were, it seems in the beginning, imagining walking with your husband or oh. was like, were those memories? It's not quite clear. So I'm like, as I was watching the film, I'm like, is this going to be one of those things where she's imagining it? I don't, I don't know. Like, I actually could start to believe that, you know, this was all something she imagined out of her grief. Oh, that's very well done. Yeah. And then you do actually, there are some very interesting things the filmmaker did regarding shooting this. There's a couple of uses of the uh, airplane bathrooms in this film. <laughs> and A, I'm not even sure if this plane, if there's planes like this in real life. This plane has a lot of bathrooms, it seems. (laughs) There's this whole little, like, half circle of bathrooms. It looks like there's about eight or so in one second. I'm like, um, I mean, I've never flown on a double-decker plane. I'm not even sure if those are real. So maybe you would, since that's a big plane. But I've never been on a plane that had more than, like, three. Wow, I could have used that on so many different flights that I've been on. Or, like, uh, even just being able to go down the aisles. Like, it always feels like you can only have one person in the aisle. Right, and you're just never allowed to stand out, even for, like, four-hour flights. It's like, if someone's going to the bathroom and someone's coming back from the bathroom, the people who are in the rows right where they meet, I'm sorry, you're just going to be uncomfortable for a few minutes because there's no way to get past that person without, like, right. leaning into your row. Yeah. But no matter this, where you are, everyone's always giving you dirty looks. Right, right? Yeah. Whenever you try and walk on a plane. Yeah, and I've never been in a flight where it's like, oh, hey, there are, you know, eight empty rows in the back. Let's go lay <laughs> out and take a nap. I'm like, what? I... A, can you even do that? Because it's not clear when they first get on, all the arms are down. So it's not clear that you can even like put the arms up to lie across those seats. Mm -hmm, But then B, mm -hmm. the flight attendants will let you do that. Right. I want to go on this flight. I mean, I don't want to go on this flight because as the other passengers, as she becomes more and more frantic, I'd be freaking out. Especially, you know, very close to 9-11. Right. And I think of like, there's a crazy person on my plane. Oh my gosh, there's a crazy person on my plane. And she does get a lot of dirty looks because... You know, they think 
even the the other passengers that she's just making this up and she's oh, just yeah. making trouble just disrupting their flight yes and this is not you know uh oh i only have to deal with this for an hour and a half flight they are flying from germany to america this is like i think a minimum eight hour flight mm-hmm. so it's just like mm-hmm. i'm not sure i'm gonna get through this whole flight so she does have a sort of ally in the air marshal there is an air marshal mm-hmm. on this flight because is there supposed to be an air marshal on every flight? I, I don't know. Do I think sometimes you're not marshals? supposed to know that they're on your flight. I, mean, I don't think you're ever supposed to yeah. know. But it just feels like it's like, is there an air? I'm, I'm not like as it was a reveal that there was an air marshal. I was like, is that on every flight? Is there always an air marshal on every flight? Considering how many flights there are. Right. There's a lot of air marshals. A day in the, you know, just the main 48, like not even going international. Mm-hmm. I'm just like. I don't know that you have that many staff. <laughs> like, how do you choose where the air marshal goes? But he is on this flight, and he at first is also just sort of like, you know, I think you're possibly a danger to this flight and the passengers mm-hmm. on it because she actually runs at one point down to the captain to try and bang on the door to get him to talk to her. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's not at all terrifying. No, like, no, that'd be awful, especially after 9-11. Right, yeah. Oh. Again, with any, I was just like, nope. But... Then she starts sort of convincing him, you know, if not that to believe that she has a daughter, just that as the, you know, law enforcement official on this flight, if there is a daughter and I basically did nothing, well, then that's on me. Oh. So he does want to help her, but he's also sort of tied with the fact that, you know, I'm just the air marshal. I'm not even a crew on this. None of the crew claim to have seen it. You know, I mean, seeing the daughter, Mm -hmm. you are on this medication, and then we get some other things that throw us off later, information. So it's like, I like you, but I'm not sure I do like you. He's with her, but he's not quite Mm -hmm. 100% with her. But I also really liked the use of turbulence in this. And I'm not sure if this is, should be credited to the director or to the screen, screenwriter, but this really added to the sense for me as an audience member of, oh, she might actually be crazy. Because the turbulence is timed to come with specific moments. And it only comes with moments like right when we're finding out something that makes it sound like she imagined her daughter. Oh. So like when she, I think, finally gets to see the captain or something. And then we get the thing where nobody has seen your daughter. Like we did a check and nobody, you get a turbulence right as we go into that moment. And so it like signaled to me of, oh, oh, her reality is shaky almost. And I was like. I actually like that. That's really well done. I get what it is, but even if you didn't immediately, it's subtle enough that it doesn't mess with the film. Mm, and like it her, take her you out, world like, is yeah. shaking and falling around her. Yeah, and it also seems that there's a number of things, and this why it, is why I think it's due to the screenwriter more so than the director. She has a number of lines about her daughter. Well, A, she says, I'm looking for my daughter so many times in this film that I was like, <laughs> I don't drink, but if I did drink, that would be an excellent drinking game because so many times I'm looking for... I was like, you can't... Don't you get tired of saying it's that? It's like is a there, Finding Nemo. I'm looking for my son. Well, is there not another way to word that other than I'm looking for my daughter? It's literally almost that every time I'm looking for my daughter. I was like, I'm pretty sure everyone in this plane by now knows you're looking for your yes, daughter. Yes, I'm sure everyone on the crew is aware. Can you say something else, please? But then she also has to talk about her daughter at times. And she has a line, something along the lines of, she's been through something. She's not herself. And this is right when they're starting to doubt her and think maybe she made it up. And so I was like, oh, so this is clearly also supposed to be a bit metaphorically about Jodie Foster's character, Mm. who's, you know, going through a a good amount of things here. I was like, okay. Like she's also lost in a way. So I really liked the filmmaker aspects of it. I didn't quite like Jodie Foster's performance. Her, like, I'm frantic, looking for my daughter, parent just felt, I mean, I assume she's never been in a similar situation, but it just felt like she didn't quite know how to play that a lot of times. It felt too frantic at other times, Mm -hmm. but then not frantic at some times, and it was just like... Not a natural performance. Right. It always felt a bit off for me for some reason, and I was just like... And then, of course... Because you start to feel like, not claustrophobic. This is a very large plane, and I do sometimes get a bit confused in scenes of where exactly they are in the plane. Because it seems that there are two staircases to take you from, you know, the lower level <laughs> to the higher level. And she goes up one, and then comes down the other. And then when they're looking for the little girl in the plane, 
they're going into all these other secret compartments that I was like, do planes all have those? They all have like holds you can walk in. <laughs> I've clearly never been in that part of a plane, but clearly I clearly never inspected an airplane before. Right? <laughs> but it's just like, and I've never flown on a plane that big, but are all planes like have a hold that big? Cause that seems really big for the planes I've flown on. I doubt they have that. Everything is just a cabinet under the stairs. Right. It's like, I, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised on how the planes I've flown in actually like fit in all the luggage. For everyone on board, I'm like, really? So they just have secret compartments everywhere, stuffing a, your bag in. Or there's a secondary plane that only flies yeah. the luggage that's following you, like a trailer on a car or something. So yeah, I like the film up until about the last part when things start getting revealed and you start finding out what's really going on. It's just mm-hmm. like, oh, um, okay, didn't see that coming. But then now that I know that, I have so many more questions Mm. (laughs) that even at the end of the film, I still feel aren't answered. And I just, I'm not as attached to Jodie Foster's performance. Do you feel like the reveals were almost too unbelievable, kind of? Well, they just did bring up a number of questions for me about how certain things could have happened, Mm. which I don't want to go into because I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it. But it's just like... Um, wait, now if I think about that reveal and think about everything that's happened in the film up to this point, I'm not sure that could have actually happened. It's like, it makes for an interesting twist, but then when I start thinking about it logically and rationally, it's like, wait, that's not, I don't know that that's actually possible. And the the ending for it feels a bit, there's almost like a double ending. You get an ending and then you get like almost an epilogue. And I feel it could have done without that epilogue just because the epilogue is slower and lighter and gives me even more time to think of all those questions of, wait, how did, (laughs) how did that happen? Now that I'm thinking about it, how did, so yeah, up until like the two thirds mark, when you start really getting into, I don't know if there is a daughter or not, that's really good. Jodie Foster's manic is not the greatest, but the script I think is really good. Hmm. So that's it for today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC movie podcast. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Movie Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program